Frank Saratello. For those of you who are new to the channel or first time visitors, I'd like to welcome you. I'm a miracle. I'm supposed to be dead. Jesus gave me the gift of a second chance in life in 2012 when they closed the expressways in Chicago, pulled me out of my truck, and rushed me to a trauma center. It was in 1984 that Jesus changed my life. If you'd like to read more about my testimony, click on the link below. That's my website. It's called themidnightcry.com. On it, you will find my testimony. You will find a section called Study Tools that has videos and articles and links to help you in your walk with Jesus. You'll also find a section called Books and Writings. I'm an international author. All of my books were written not for profitability, but to get a message out. And you can read every one of my books for free in their entirety on my website, including this, Twisting the Truth, Church Lies, Manipulating the Word of God to Build a Religious Kingdom. This basically is a book that starts in the early 80s when Jesus changed my life up until now, and it shows how the religious system has spiraled out of control. If you are returning and you're a subscriber, first and foremost, guys, I cannot thank you enough for your financial support. I, it really, it, it's really wonderful, and I, I cannot thank you enough. I thank you for the emails, the phone calls, the text messages. Um, it, it's just really, really, it's such a blessing for all you guys' support. Um, before I get into the video, I, I just want to let you know and for those of you who are returning, on January 1st, I released a video that the Lord had given me the same dream three times in five nights. And I'll put the link in case you're a new subscriber and you want to take it out. Um, but since that time, I have met other people that have had the same dream or comparable. So ladies and gentlemen, this is a time of preparation. And this video is basically a call. It is a presentation of the Word of God, and what we're going to do is we're going to go a little slower today, but we want to take the Word of God and compare what the Word of God says with, we're going to compare it with the religious church system. And if you make a decision, I'm just going to present to you facts and the Word of God, and then you take a look and say, wait a minute, is what the Word of God says going on in the church system, is this what's, go is this what's going on? You make a decision, I'm just going to present to you facts. In Revelation chapter 17, verse 5, it says, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. So we have to see that Babylon is actually a mystery. And the word mystery is the Greek number 3466, and it means a religious secret, a hidden meaning, a secret. And in this presentation, we're going to see that Babylon is not America, nor is it the Catholic Church. Okay? So many people that are, quote, end-time prophecy experts, whatever that is, I can't find that in the Bible. Um, people that are trying to make reputations are trying to put a label on things. America is Babylon. America is, is the eagle, whatever. Remember, ladies and gentlemen, the Word of God was written to God's people for God's people, about God's people. And today, as Gentiles, if we are born again by the Spirit of God, we are the modern day Jew. Read in Romans chapter two, let's turn there real quick, just so there's no mistaken. Okay, Paul writing says this, but he is a Jew who is inwardly and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. So we see that we are the modern day Jew. There's the physical Jew and the spiritual Jew. We are the spiritual Jew. And what we have to remember is that the Word of God is a sealed book. Isaiah 29 verses 9 through 14 tells us the book is sealed. Only when we are humble and we get before God will God open our understanding. It is the Lord God who sits in the heavens, who opens our ears to hear, to open our eyes to see, and touches our heart to understand. And that comes when we are humble before God. In Deuteronomy 29, 29, it says that the secret things belong to the Lord. 
And in Psalm 25, 14, it says, the secret of the Lord is with those who fear him. So the Lord wants to reveal his secrets. In Isaiah 45, 13, it says, the Lord will give us the hidden riches of his word. And you see, ladies and gentlemen, as long as we are disciples of Jesus, following the Word of God, following Jesus, the Word of God, and not following religious traditions or denominations or doctrines of men, God, as we stay humble, will reveal more to us. In Matthew 13, 11, it says, To you, disciples, it has been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. Everybody else, it comes as a parable. <clears throat> So that with that in mind, ladies and gentlemen, I want, to, I want to share something with you. And the word judge freaks people out. You're not allowed to judge me. Only God can judge me. Well, in John chapter 7, verse 24, Jesus gives us this command. He says, do not judge by appearance, but, 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 Judge with righteous judgment. Wait a minute. That flies in the face of everything we've been taught. Jesus himself tells us we are supposed to judge with righteous judgment. What exactly is righteous judgment? And how do we judge with righteous judgment? The term righteous judgment is used all through the Word of God. Yet nobody will talk about that because people do not want to or refuse or ignore the fact that we are allowed and we're supposed to judge. One of the times that the, the term judge righteously is in Proverbs 31. Everybody talks about, I want a wife that's the Proverbs 31 wife. That's wonderful, but you know what the Proverbs 31 wife is supposed to do? In verse 19 says, judge righteously. Leviticus 19.19 19 talks about judging righteously. And Paul, speaking to the church in Corinth, tells us to judge. Judge the people in the house. People get freaked out because people want to continue to live in their lawless ways. So what does it mean to judge righteously? Well, let's look at a couple of definitions. Number one, the first thing we have to look at is the number 13 biblically means rebellion to God. And as you go through God's Word, you're going to find that there's many times that you're going to see verses, uh, chapters, that the number 13 is very prevalent. There's not, it's not an, a coincidence that Revelation 13 is all about the false prophet and being in rebellion to God. That's just one. But now the word judge. Webster's definition is to form an opinion, to form an opinion through careful weighing of evidence and testing. So what we're going to do, ladies and gentlemen, is we're going to make a presentation and you're going to judge for yourself. The word babble in the dictionary, the definition, a confused noise made by a number of voices. How about that? A confused noise made by a number of voices. Now here's a word that I know is in your Bibles. If you're using a King James or New King James, it may even be in the New American Standard, I'm not sure, but I know in the King James and New King James, it's there for sure. It's the word tumult, T-U-M-U-L-T, -U -L -T, tumult. And the definition of a tumult is a loud, confused noise, sounds like babble, especially one caused by large masses of people. So I want you to take this so that when you're reading your Bibles, things will look in a different light and God will open up the word to you. The word harlot, a person who has sex with someone in exchange for money. What we're going to see biblically it doesn't always mean that it means. It just means somebody unfaithful to God. Just like the word adulteress, a woman who is not faithful to her husband. So with this in mind, let's look at the following. And we have to keep this in mind, ladies and gentlemen. Whatever Jesus is or has, whatever Jesus is or has, Satan imitates. 
Satan is the great imposter. Whatever Satan cannot prevent, he will pervert. That's why he's called an angel of light. Jesus is the ruler of heaven. Satan is the ruler of this world. John 12, 31, 1430, 1611. Satan is the ruler of this world. Satan can't do anything unless God allows him. Always keep that in mind. Read Job 31. That'll give you some insight. And you can read 1 Samuel chapter 15 where God sends demons on Saul. That's a whole different teaching. We'll get into that later. But now we have to look at a contrast. Jesus is love. Satan is lust. So as I'm giving you these things, I want you to think about and compare it to people that you know that profess to be Christians and the church system. Now we have to judge righteously. Jesus is humble. Satan is proud and arrogant. So look at the church system and you can see pride and arrogance. Jesus is submissive to the will of God. Satan is rebellious to the word of God. Jesus gives you the word of God. Satan manipulates and twists the word of God. Jesus is the Christ. Satan is the Antichrist. But the word anti in the Greek does not necessarily mean against or opposed. It actually means instead of, a substitute, or in place of. And this is important because you're going to see that instead of people worshiping Jesus, they are following a system, a church, a denomination, a tradition. Very important. The biggest obstacle that Jesus had to face when he talked to the religious Pharisees was religious traditions, which is mentioned 13 times in the, New, in the King James Bible. And tradition is rebellion to God. Jesus is the Word of God. Satan manipulates the Word of God. He forms man's doctrines. And the first time this happens is in Genesis chapter 3, verses 4 and 5. It is not a coincidence, it is by divine design by God that John the Baptist and Jesus referred to the religious leadership as vipers. Vipers are snakes. Who deceived Eve in the garden was a snake, Satan. And what did he do? He twisted the word of God. God told Eve, you shall not eat off of the tree. And what did Satan say? He put doubt in her mind. Has God really said that, Eve? Didn't you know that God said that when you do it, you're going to be like him? He manipulated. He twisted the word of God so that Eve would be deceived. Isn't that what's going on in the religious system today, ladies and gentlemen? If someone will not answer your question according to the word of God and explains it away like, oh, well, we're not in the Old Testament. Well, that was for that culture. There's a problem. There is a problem. I ran into it not long ago. A woman said she was a pastor. And I know this is going to make a lot of women angry, but the fact of the matter is, a woman, according to 1 Timothy chapter 2, is not allowed to have authority over a man or teach. And this woman went to say, well, that was for the culture. This is called cultural Christianity when people manipulate the Word of God to satisfy their burning desires for what they want to do for God instead of being submissive to the Word of God. Jesus has his church. Satan has the synagogue of Satan. And what's interesting, in Revelation chapter 2, verse 9, and Revelation chapter 3, verse 9, Jesus, talking to the churches, says, they claim to be Jews, but they're not. They are of the synagogue of Satan. So we could say that many people that profess to be Christians, that are not living like Jesus, are part of a church of Satan, synagogue of Satan. They say they're Christian, but they're not. Jesus has a bride of peace. Jesus has his people live in perfect peace. Satan has the harlot. They live in confusion. 
The name Babylon is mentioned 274 times in the Word of God. And here's a perfect example. 274. Add 2 plus 7 plus 4, you get the number 13. And if you look, and I googled it, when you look up Babylon, and the very first thing that came up when I put Babylon in Google said, Babylon is in the Bible a symbol of sin and rebellion. A symbol of sin and rebellion. According to Webster's Dictionary, Babylon is a city of materialism and sexual, and sexual pleasure. The word Babylon comes from the word Babel in Genesis chapter 11 verse 4. And what does it say in Genesis chapter 11 verse 4? People got together and said, let us build a city and a tower whose top or the head is in heaven and let us make a name for ourselves. Isn't that what's going on in the Christian community today, ladies and gentlemen? People want to make themselves somebody. I cannot tell you how many times people come in to Panera and talk to me and say, well, I'm pastor, so I'm evangelist so-and-so. I'm just... And right away they want to throw a title. I'm a bishop. I'm a deacon. When you stand before God, that title means nothing, ladies and gentlemen. We're supposed to be brothers and sisters in Jesus. That's what we're supposed to do. And Genesis chapter 11 is the foundation of how the church system has come about and spiraled in, in, out of control. It starts in Exodus chapter 34, verses 10 through 17, when God tells Moses to warn the people, do not intermingle with the other nations, because their gods and their idols will turn your heart from me. And then in Deuteronomy 31, Moses prophesies that these people are going to play the harlot against me. Why? Because they go after the gods and the har the gods and idols of the other nations. God's people play the harlot by submitting to the other gods and nations around them. Why do you think the Lord called his people to be separate? We are supposed to be his special treasure. We are the apple of his eye. He doesn't want us to mingle with other nations. When you look at Babylon and you look at the religious church system, it does not teach people how to love Jesus with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength and lay down their life to love their neighbors themselves. No, it teaches people to believe in Jesus. It teaches people another gospel. Accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior and you will be saved. I can't find that in the Bible because the, the apostles and the prophets didn't preach that. They preached repentance and bear fruit in keeping with that repentance. They have re disregarded the covenant of God and changed loving Jesus into just believing him. No self-sacrifice, no self-denial, self-indulgence, all your sins, past, present, and future will be forgiven as long as you say this prayer, which is an abomination before God. The word church in the Greek means ekklesia, and that definition means a called out one. So if this is what the true meaning of church is, what is Jesus' church called out of? We're called out of the world, ladies and gentlemen. Why do you think James rebukes the New Testament church in James 4, 4 when he calls them, you're an adulterer, you're an adulteress. Don't you know that friendship with the world is, a, is an enemy of God? Because the people are mingling with the world, just like it is today. That's why 1 John says in chapter 2, do not love the world nor the things in the world. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life are not of God. And what has happened is the church system, Babylon, does not teach people how to crucify the flesh with its passions and desires. It does not teach the people how to crucify your desires by looking at the idols, like it says in Ezekiel chapter 6, verse 9. It does not teach people how to walk humbly with God. I had a conversation just an hour and a half ago with a woman, and she made the comment, 
that today's Christianity is so arrogant they look down on people and we're supposed to get underneath people. We're supposed to build people up, not look down upon them. The whole church system has mingled with the world, friends with the world, enemies of God. They honor God with their lips and their hearts are far away. They cherry pick the word of God to pick out what they like because they're looking for the praises of man opposed to the approval of God. And the word of God is very clear when it says, Woe unto you when men speak false, when men speak well of you because they did the same thing of your father, the false prophets. Luke 6, 26. And isn't that what everybody wants to be? They want to be loved by people. They want to be looked up to. Why do you think churches build stages so they can look down upon people? I don't see anywhere in the Gospels, and if anybody knows it, please email me. I don't see anywhere where Jesus got up above everybody. He, he stood on the flat ground. He stood on the boats. He sat amongst the people. Jesus was the most humble of all humble of humility, the pinnacle of humility. And today's people behind pulpits, the prostitutes behind pulpits, are so arrogant they look down and when you question them, they look at you like, who are you to question my authority? This is all Babylon. Why do you think in Isaiah chapter 14, Lucifer is referred to as the king of Babylon? Read Isaiah 14 and you will see that Lucifer is the king of Babylon. Because he controls the way the whole system works. There's not a Catholic Christian, there's not a Presbyterian Christian, a Pentecostal Christian, a Baptist Christian. Christians are supposed to be disciples of Jesus, not denominational. And by the way, did you ever think, by the way, did you ever think that the word denomination actually means demon nation? Think about that. A demon nation following the doctrines of demons, the traditions of men, instead of following the whole counsel of God. The word harlot is mentioned 32 times in the word of God. And it's Jews because God's people are not faithful to him. In Hosea, when you read Hosea chapter 2, you are going to see that God rebukes the people saying, you are not my wife and you are not my children. The children of a harlot. The children of harlots. That is why Babylon is called the mother of harlots. The religious system teaches people how not to be faithful to God. They are unfaithful to God. They are not in love with Jesus. They are not faithful to Jesus. That's why when God unleashes hell on earth, the people that believe in Jesus are going to be folding like houses of cards in the winds because they really don't love him. And they're going to say, Lord, Lord, where are you? Where are you? And as it says in Proverbs chapter 1, that when I called you, you would not answer. When I reached out my hand, you disregarded. I will laugh at your calamity, saith the Lord. Because you chose the pleasures of sin rather than dying to yourself. You chose the approval of man instead of the approval of God. And does it not say that in the last days, in Timothy, that the very first thing it says is, men would be lovers of themselves. Let's look there real quick. It says in 1 Timothy chapter 4, I believe it is. I'm sorry, 2 Timothy chapter 3, it says, but know this, in the last days perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves and lovers of money. And then it goes on to the whole list. Isn't that what's going on today, ladies and gentlemen? Everything is based around self-love, vanity. Look at me, I, me, my. And you wonder why God's bringing judgment on the hypocritical religious system? All you have to do, and I mentioned this, with, I mentioned this to a girl the other day, and her eyes lit up like, you gotta be kidding. And I've mentioned this in other videos, but I need to repeat it again. Job, Job had sin. Read Job chapter 29, 30, and 31, and you will see that Job refers to himself, I, me, my, 190 times. Pride and arrogance. God had to bring him to a place of humility to break him down, to build him up. 
That's why it says in Job 41, everyone came to Job to comfort him for the judgment that God had brought, the discipline that God had brought, the demons that God had sent. Let me read that real quick just so there's no misunderstanding here. Listen to what the Word of God says in Job chapter 41. It says, And they consoled Job and comforted him for all the adversity that the Lord had brought upon him. God sent the demons to discipline Job. That was the whole idea. As a matter of fact, it says in Job chapter 33, verse 19, it says, Man is also chastened with pain on his bed. On his bed. But the word chasten is the Hebrew number 3198. It means to correct by punishment. God has to discipline us. Why do you think it says in Hebrews chapter 12, thinking that, thinking that strange that God disciplines us? Here, let's go there real quick. Wasn't planning on going there, but we got to go there because it's important. God says this, do not despise the chastening, the discipline of the Lord. We're his children. If we're out of line, God's got to discipline us. It's a way to bring us to a place of humility to call on Abba Father that he will heal us. If my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves, seek my face, pray, and turn from their sin. People forget about the last one, turn from your sin. It's not repentance if you keep doing the same thing. Repentance means I'm sorry and you stop doing it. You struggle against your sin. You struggle until you come to the point of shedding blood. That's why it says in Hebrews chapter 11, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood in your striving against sin. And without the shedding of blood, there is no, re no forgiveness of sin. We have to overcome. That's why Jesus' bride are those who, they overcome by the blood of the Lamb, the word of their testimony, and they love not their life unto death. They die. He that wishes to save his life will lose it. He who loses his life for my sake in the gospel, they will find it. I want to thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for taking the time to listen to this, this video, this teaching. I pray that you take these words to heart. Go over the Word of God. Go over this video. Get it in your heart so you understand. If you see people and you know people that are struggling with the church system, please share the video. Let them see. Let them make the comparisons. Jesus is love. Satan is lust. Jesus is coming for a church without spot or wrinkle. Not a church that's filled with the world. He's calling for an ecclesia. People that have been separated from the world. Our citizenship is in heaven, not here on earth. We lay up our treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not corrupt. And God is our God and we are his children. We're walking in the covenant of God. Next week we're going to do a video. The Lord has already given me the title in regards to the coming Holocaust, the coming Christian Holocaust. You're not going to want to miss it. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you again for taking the time to listen to this video. Remember, it's impossible to love Jesus too much, but you and I will go to hell if we've loved him too little. Thank you again, and good night.